Good morning. It's nice to be here. Uh, this is kind of a homecoming for me. I started my uh, career out of college in Grand Junction, Colorado, working for the uh, Soil Conservation Service. Anybody remember the Soil Conservation Service? A few of you? Okay. Yeah, I was here in 1974 and 75. Uh, I would dare say that probably 60% of this campus did not exist at that time. And it had just gone from a two-year community college to a four-year uh, college. So, rather interesting. My wife almost has a degree from here. But I moved. <laughs> and so she lacks about a quarter of having a, uh, her college degree. But it was going to be in art from Mesa College. So, at any rate, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to give you a little information about some uh, projects that were done in Kansas uh, nearly 10 years ago and uh, give you a little bit of an update on that. Before I get into it though, I want to let you know that the real expert that's here in the room from Kansas that can speak to this issue is Scott Marsh. Scott, stand up so people can see who you are. And then, so if I'm deferring any questions on salt cedar in Kansas to Scott, okay? <laughs> he works for the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Uh, weed division. All right, let's see. Advances the right aerial. I take it. Oh, it works. All right, very good. Uh, we have a few little minor problems here. Anyway, the two groups that uh, you're going to be hearing about today are the Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition that I currently work with as a contractor, and then the uh, Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams, which is uh, uh, a group I used to work with as a contractor. I was their state coordinator from 1999 through 2007. So anyway, to give you a little bit of background about both these groups, the uh, Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams is a 501c3. They organized back in the uh, uh, middle 90s. Um, you can see their mission and vision. You can find more of this information out on the web, and I'll give you those websites here momentarily. Um, this is the Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition. We're a state educational not-for-profit. We have filed for 501c3 status. Um, we haven't gotten that yet, but we're working on it. Again, our mission and vision is to uh, regenerate the Kansas grazing land. And by the way, as you're looking at some of the photos, the first few photos, I'll back up here. These were photos from the, some of the project sites, okay, that we're working on. This is on the... Uh, uh, Cimarron River, which is in the southern part of Kansas in the western half of the state, and it is an intermittent stream, intermittent river, if you will, uh, as are several of our rivers in Kansas uh, for various reasons. But anyway, uh, you'll notice as we move through this that the, uh, this was demonstration site, again, looking across the river the other direction to the south, and then this was after treatment, just so you kind of get a feel for what was done. This work was uh, carried out through the Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams. Uh, the group is organized uh, kind of on a sub-basis with chapters, and these chapters are made up of local partners. Uh, the area that we're looking at right here would be the uh, uh, Cimarron River chapter and the Buffalo Wallow chapter. This, for your information, this is where the Ark River runs through, comes through here and then comes down this way. And the Cimarron starts here, goes out, and comes back here, and goes down. So that will give you some idea as to relationship there. All right, partners in this, obviously, were the landowners that we were working with. Kansas Department of Agriculture used to be known as the State Conservation Commission, now the Division of Conservation. So if you hear me say State Conservation Commission, this is who I'm referencing. Uh, the Department of Wildlife and Parks, and now Tourism. Uh, little combination there. The U.S. Geological Survey, the Kansas Geological Survey, uh, USDA's NRCS at the local level and state level, the uh, Kansas Water Office, and then the Mead and Clark County Conservation Districts, as well as the, uh, the chapters that I just mentioned. Purpose really of these demonstration projects was, was to uh, evaluate control methods find the most feasible and economic methods to do that. The funding came through two grants through fiscal year 2003-2004 of a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, challenge cost share agreement. And 
those uh, two agreements were for about $75,000 each. So over the um, span of those grants, we spent about $150,000, which is not much compared to what our previous speaker was just telling us as far as uh, investments that other states have made. And this wasn't even Kansas money necessarily. About 50000 of it was uh, uh, from, from state government. So at any rate, uh, we also, uh, in this process, used um, the, uh, the rancher in kind, uh, as well as uh, we documented partner time, uh, which would primarily be agency folks. Uh, to implement this process, we organized a task force, and that's one of the things that I think I can uh, uh, tell you that's a kind of a strong suit of the Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams. Is a, it's a very partner-based, very grassroots-based. So we put together a task force, and it was comprised mainly of the members of these two chapters that I talked about, the Buffalo Wallow and the uh, Cimarron River chapters. Uh, they were very helpful in helping us determine the uh, ranking criteria. Uh, they helped with publicity and marketing. They also helped in the selection of the projects. And then uh, they assisted in uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the projects uh, as well. So it was... Uh, a very uh, partner-driven uh, demonstration process. Just to give you some idea of uh, some of the materials that were developed in this process, there was ranking criteria over here. Uh, that's probably small enough you're not going to read it. Trust me, there's some interesting things on there that we were evaluating people uh, and their projects on. And then there was also a project profile form, which was the actual form that uh, people used to uh, apply for their demonstration project. Uh, the treatments were implemented uh, over a three-year period. There were some other treatments that were uh, applied that uh, I was not involved with, and so I didn't feel comfortable enough speaking about those. But anyway, this is from 2004 through 2006, and the treatments consisted of uh, mechanical removal and burning, mechanical shredding, uh, stump cut and herbicide treatments, and then we used uh, goats as a biological treatment on one of the uh, demonstrations. Just to give you some idea, this was uh, the stump cut uh, process. This was done on the Dunn Ranch. Um, it was uh, mechanical saw and spray. I think you can probably, if your eyesight is good, you can see the blue mist coming out here treating the stump. Uh, this basically was uh, cut, pile, and burn. Uh, what was left, the aftermath. This just gives you a few uh, shots of what the equipment looked like and the fact that we were dealing with uh, some rather significant sized salt cedar. And this would be what I would call a moderately infested to a heavily infested site. It was about 20 acres that we worked on. Again, you can see that uh, how the saw was set up chemical application, spray nozzle. Here was an interesting one. I'd never seen this before. This was on the Arnold Ranch in Clark County. And this is a hydro axe. And that hydro axe is a, uh, a huge rotary mower on hydraulics that you can get about 25 feet in the air. Uh, anybody familiar with those? I hadn't seen one until this. OK, a few of you. All right. Yeah, this was kind of this was kind of a macho thing, you know, a NASCAR thing, really, because it, it was big and powerful, and, and everybody, that, at least the guys that saw it, they all wanted to run it. But yeah, they are. Uh, this rancher actually bought this machine uh, from a power company in s southeast United States, and that's what they used to keep their uh, utility right-of-ways uh, cleaned up with. So at any rate, uh, it was awesome, but. I shot this with a telephoto lens. I didn't do any wide angle work, I can tell you that, uh, when I was there. I didn't want to get too close to it. Uh, basically, we had three treatments there. And again, I apologize for these slides. When I put them together, they were white when I was uh, putting the copy down here. But it was a 60 acre plot divided into three different plots. 20 acres were mow only, repeated mowing. One uh, plot uh, was mow and burn. And the third plot was mow and spray. And we were using uh, Remedy, which is 
uh, we were using three parts of diesel and a part remedy, okay? So that's what the treatments were. Uh, on this particular site, and this is Dave Arnold uh, standing there by the gauge, um, who is the landowner, we uh, had the involvement of the Geological Survey, Kansas Geological Survey as well, on uh, looking at uh, changes in water level uh, during the course of the treatments, and there were some significant findings in that, and uh, unfortunately I could not find those, but I can get you to the right people if you're interested in seeing what took place there. Uh, again, this is the hydro axe, just to show you this, and this happens to be a Russian olive tree, it wasn't tamarisk, but this was about a 25 foot tree, and he just started down on it, you can see he got it down to the ground, and when he's done, that's, that's pretty much all that's left, except for little shreds, so kind of cool. The other thing we did was a, uh, uh, our biological control with goats, and uh, this was on the Adams Ranch. And you can see here that uh, this herd of about 100 goats uh, was set on four and a half acres, and we had repeat applications on this. Uh, you can tell that they've uh, uh, denuded quite a bit of this. These were all set up pretty scientifically, actually, and the gentleman that did that was this fellow right here. He's the district conservationist, now retired in Meade County, Tom Flowers, and they went out, they set these up, uh, they did photo points, they did a vegetative uh, inventory before, during, and after, so there's lots of nice analysis here on these sites to see what was taking place. I'm not going to share much of that with you this morning, but uh, just to let you know that that did take place. And that information is available. This happened to be on a tour that we did after the first year that the goats were on this site. Just another shot here to show you. And this was right down to the water's edge. You can see here that they had uh, uh, access right here for the goats to get the water on this site. Uh, this rancher here was the one that was uh, uh, did the cut stump and spray. This rancher actually uh, was one of our later projects. That's not part of the, the presentation that I'm giving you here today. But he had actually completed a project on his ranch as well. Well, the outcomes basically, we determined that the cut and spray was the best option for control and uh, cost per acre treatment. If memory serves me well, I think that the uh, the gardeners were able to do this on the Dunn Ranch for about $210 an acre, which is about, at that time, about maybe a half of the price of the land. So, uh, but fairly effective. On the Arnold Ranch, the only, that was not so good. A lot of re-sprouting, and uh, it just didn't, didn't take. Uh, mowing and burning, again, really not so good. One reason is is that this is out in a uh, country that's about oh, 18 inches of precip, tends to be droughty. You don't get to use fire very often. So uh, the interval out there might be once in 10 years, you might be able to do that. So we did not get to burn these sites during the demonstration process. So it was, it was drying up there. The mowing spray was fair, but not effective. One of the downsides of mowing, obviously, is, is that uh, you disperse the material. And so you, uh, if you have the right conditions, you do get a little re-sprouting with that. And the cost per acre were fairly high. That hydrax is not really cheap to run. So uh, we determined that the two options that were the most feasible were the cut and spray and potentially the goats. The goats were um, not terribly effective, but we know why, because we weren't stocked heavy enough and probably the fact that we put them in a two, two of, uh, the site we used, the uh, salt cedar was too mature. We should have probably done some treatment ahead of time and let them graze the aftermath or the re-sprout. So, but we do think that there is potential there. Other outcomes that came from this, uh, really the, the Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams initiated and uh, carried the interest in uh, salt cedar work in Kansas. Uh, from this demonstration, some of the follow-up uh, uh, tours and uh, field days that we had, uh, we initiated a statewide task force 
There was a development of a 10-year uh, strategic plan for Tamaraz control that was based largely off of Colorado's. Uh, when you have a good plan, why change it much? Just substitute names and places. So uh, that is what came out of that. Uh, several other uh, control projects were completed um, using a variety of funding sources uh, from the Kansas Alliance for Weapons and Streams. Uh, some of the grant money that I spoke of earlier was used on those. So there were several other projects that were completed. We actually moved into two or three other counties to do that. Uh, it was featured on a tour that was attended by about 75 people in 2008 on two, uh, a couple of the newer sites. Also, the Division of Conservation uh, in 2008 or 2009 completed an aerial treatment uh, in Hamilton County, which is up on the Arkansas River. That's easy for me to say, because if you're from Kansas, it's the Arkansas River. But, so it's the Arkansas River. Uh, uh, right on this Colorado-Kansas state line. And they treated about 80 acres there, uh, or more, maybe 160. It was quite a stretch along the river, uh, which turned out to be fairly effective. Uh, some other things have taken place since then. Uh, they were working on uh, releasing the uh, beetle at that time. There were a couple of beetle releases. Again, that was not a part of our demonstration, so I'm not going to really speak to it here. And as I understand, and visiting with Scott, that uh, there have been some recent beetle releases, and uh, they're looking very promising. So um, just to give you some additional information, if you want to go to the Kansas Alliance for Weapons and Streams website, it's simplycause.org, or you can go to the Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition website, kglc.org. Uh, for information on this and a host of a whole lot of other things that affect riparian areas, wetlands, streams, uh, and for KGLC, uh, any of the grazing lands in Kansas. Uh, there is, happens to be a PDF of a report that was put up there, and that's the one that uh, is referencing the Kansas Water Office right here. One thing we always wanted to do, too, uh, was to try to do some things in terms of uh, making use of the biomass, and we never found funding to do that, but we think there might be potential in it. So that would be something that uh, I think would be interesting to see what we could come up with. You know, the whole prospect of uh, taking the biomass off-site might create some issues, so there's a lot of thinking that would need to go into that. We were thinking more of using maybe a tub grinder on-site so you didn't uh, contaminate other places, and then moving that material uh, confined from there. So, with that, I think I am through. And I would entertain any questions you might have. Yes? Why was cutting the spring more effective than mowing the spring? Well, the main reason in the mowing is that you were distributing and dispersing a lot of material. And with the Stump cutter, you basically just cut it off, pick it up with a gravel, take it over to pile it, burn it, and it was gone. Uh, not so much just redistributing the stuff. Um, it also seemed like that the stump cut just was more effective because the way the, the treatment worked was is you, you go out and treat uh, a certain area and then come back uh, with the hydro axe and then come back and spray it. And it seemed like the longer you let that stump sit without treating it, that that affected uh, the ability of the chemical to work on it. 